This is episode 37 of the Immunology Podcast, Co-Evolution of the Human Microbiome with Drs. Ruth Lay and Sarah Clayson. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Roud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Drs. Ruth Lay and Sarah Clayson from the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology on the podcast, here to talk about their research on the co-evolution of microbiomes, which makes me very, very happy. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... Looking for a quick reference that you can hang on your lab wall? Stem Cell Technologies has various wall charts covering different immunology topics, including a snapshot of COVID-19, an overview of antigen processing and presentation, and more. Explore all the immunology wall charts and order your copy for free at stemcell.com forward slash immunology world chart. So, Brenda, you know what this means with this upcoming episode here we have going on. Oh my God, more microbes. It's I can't take microbiome. this anymore. Everything is a microbiome, right? It's like wherever you see, all the roads lead to the same answer. It's all about our bugs. But I'm excited. I am always learn something. It's nice because going in and out, out of your comfort zone, you learn something. So I'm always happy to 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 bring and and I can just, you know, sit back and relax and just let you do the, all the talking. I mean, that's also kind of nice. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So it's fall. Do you guys have pumpkin spice lattes in Amsterdam? Not that I know of, but there are there are Starbucks here, so they probably do have uh, them. So But it hasn't no, spread we have outside stuff. the Starbucks uh, everywhere else. No, here we just have pre-Christmas already coming up, I think. So it's like they start with some of the food. I see there's this little cookies that are like Christmas things. They're called pepernoten and they're meant to be eaten around Christmas. But they're already being sold. I think they're already being sold at, at supermarkets. And that's what that marks the start of the festive season. And I think it's already started. I mean, it's almost October now, right? Yeah, it, it's, well, it's September. We have a month to October. Is, is, is Halloween? <laughs> A thing for you guys at all? Well, yeah, I guess, but I, th um, I think it has been imported, and in the Netherlands, I don't think it was a thing. I think it has become a thing, like in most of other countries in the world. Um, I'm not sure how much of a tradition there was. I don't think so. Interesting, because like th uh, Christmas doesn't start until after Halloween. Like if you try to put your Christmas, start doing Christmas stuff now, people get a little antsy until Halloween. But November first. Mariah Carey for two months. I oh my god, I re I respect that. I do think that there should be a limited amount of time for for Christmas. That so you make it special, right? And here in the Northern Hemisphere, you need to make it special because the winter is hard and this latitude. So I understand you're making all the fuss. And here, you know, everything gets light. There's lights, but you know, also here in the Netherlands, like Christmas starts like in the end of November, like for real, like Santa Claus actually, so they have the Santa Claus character that comes at the end of November, early December, I forgot the exact times. So it's like, it's like a very different, like turn of events compared to other Christmases. Very interesting. interesting. I, I barely understand Christmas because I don't celebrate it. I just get inundated with the songs and, you know, the Santas yeah. and the yeah. carols, but that's okay. I mean, whatever you do, you need to do to get through winter. I this interview is a mental version of my Christmas. But before we get to that, we have some papers to cover. I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that uh, segue there. Flawless. I, I got one paper just to start with, since we'll stay on theme here. Okay. This one is rhythmicity of intestinal IgA responses confers oscill oscillatory commensal microbiota mutualism. Wow. Such big words. Please it go is. on. Yeah. Uh, first author is Hugo Penny. Last author is Matthew R. Hepworth. It came out in Science Immunology. Let me give you the date. The September 2nd. So we know our guts secrete IgA. That IgA interacts and we think affects the microbiome, but we're not really sure if and how. And we also know that the bacteria in our gut follows circadian rhythms, but we don't really understand it. And we know that IgA apparently has circadian rhythms in its excretion. And so they try to look at all this together at once. And they found that it's a highly interdependent system. So intestinal IgA responses have a diurnal rhythmicity, so morning, evening rhythmicity going on. And they find that if they knock out a clock that 
goes away. So if they start knocking out uh, circadian rhythm genes, that those that goes away to a decent extent. And it's not related to the number of plasma cells or IgA positive. It's how much they pump out. Um, so first they find that uh, this does indeed happen. So the transcriptional rhythmicity is dependent on cell clocks. Um, and that's the first step they find. But the secretion isn't. So they knocked out ARNTL, which is one of the clock genes, that then kind of destroys the circadian rhythm clock. And they find that the transcriptional regulation that's controlling this program goes away, but they're still secreting rhythmically. It's just how much they secrete is less because the transcriptional regulation is all screwy. So step one of this circadian cycle of IGA seems to be your internal circadian rhythm measures. And if they switch the little day and light cycle, the mice, it screws everything up and flips it, right? So it's, it's your standard clock circadian rhythm. Then they go, well, what's causing the IGA? And they find that it's feeding associated metabolic cues. So the metabolic program doesn't change over time with circadian rhythm. But if you have more food coming in and you're highly metabolically active pumping out IGA, you put more food, you make more IGA. And so they found that the mice is eating relates their day night cycle, which then drives the IGA production. So nutrient av availability and intrinsic metabolic activity are there. And some circadian genes are fed affected by metabolism but not a ton so it kind of it dampened it but didn't get rid of it and then they knock out and then they reverse feeding also does what you'd expect and then high fat diet where you just kind of calorically excess them make them um glucose you know less tolerant that ablates the effects too so if you kind of just make them have a steady state like they don't sense differences in glucose as well because you've made them eat a lot of fatty food then you lose the effect too so it's really about nutrient sensing and then the downstream parts then they go into the microbiome. So fundamentally, there's just an epic amount of crosstalk. So they, 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 they start with a class switch, a mouse that lacks the ability to class switch IG, IgG. So they have no IgA. Because if they just do an IgA ablation, IgM compensates for what IgA does in the gut. And so you can't figure out the studies. They actually use something that's clever and prevents class switching. So you can't get the antigen that you want. You can't get the class switching back to an IgM, IgM rescue. So they find that some bacteria are shaped by the IgA, but it's not as robust as they would want, but that the spikes do are partially dry. The changes in IgA are partially driving, but not completely driving the changes in bacteria you see with circadian rhythm. But also guess what? The diet of the person eating it eating food, or in this case, the mouse, also drives the circadian rhythm that you see in the gut bugs, right? So both the IgA secreted, which is dependent on what you eat, and the fact that you're eating affects the fuel source for the bug, which affects what they do. So that's not surprising. But then they did some germ-free stuff. Then the germ-free wasn't as spectacular as they were expecting it to be. Um, it basically kind of was such a, a, a big step that it, it, it had nothing there. Right, so there were no bacteria at all in the mice to have variants in nutrient sensing and sense anything. You just had a different microbiota because there, you know, there is no microbiota. There's germ-free, and so you, you, it's still oscillating with food. But if you ablate suddenly with antibiotics, it screws up the circadian rhythm. So if you give a bunch of mice antibiotics, the IgA secretion and the gut and the cycling nutrient sensing also get screwed up, but they weren't able to disentangle. Is that because, well, the microbiota are responding? There's no microbiota there, and so that's affecting the met metabolic profile of what's in your gut for your cells to then produce IgA, or, the, it, or is the microbiota signaling to the, Ig, to the plasma cells to make more IgA? You basically, with a sudden switch, they couldn't disentangle that, but that sudden change is important, and they were able to sort that out. So there you go. What you eat and the time of day with circadian rhythm, which are also related because we kind of eat based on our day-night cycle, affect the IgA produced by your body, which somewhat shapes the microbiome, although it's hard to get deep signaling on that. And the microbiome, in turn, affects the metabolites in your gut, which affects the IgA secreted that are affecting the microbiome.
So everything affects everything. Right. It's kind of like the co-evolution we're going to talk about soon. There's no chicken and no egg. It all came at once. Nice. So more questions than answers. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess it makes sense. I mean, you put it that way. It's like, yeah, I mean, bacteria react to the food you eat. They make, but you don't know if it's like they make stuff that then signals to your body and affects IgA production. So it would be interesting to know more the details of that interaction. But uh, it's also very interesting that they put this all study together to to show that there's these codependencies. Well, thanks for sharing uh, another microbiota related story to a microbiota themed uh, episode. And I'm going to move on to a different theme. My theme, T-cells doing stuff. That's great. And a first in man results experiment clinical trial for CAR T cell engineered CAR T sorry, Cas9 engineered CAR T cells for um, lymphoma. So this paper is a very short paper, I have to say. It's a short kind of um, um, what would the report on the results of a clinical trial, small phase one, eight patients, but with uh, CAR T cells that had an anti C19 CAR. Uh, that have, were introduced to the cells exclusively through uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and the um, introduction of a double-stranded DNA template. So no viral uh, at all, viral integration at all. And this is the first of the reported clinical trial with such a product. And I think it really is the start of a new era in um, T-cell production. So this is a um, this paper comes from China, which have been very uh, eager to to do clinical trials around CAR T cell, uh, sorry around uh, CRISPR editing. They actually also a couple of years ago they released together at a very similar time to the first uh, first ever published uh, clinical trial with CRISPR uh, CRISPR T cells for cancer. Uh, it was already also from from China. Together with a uh, in which they sorry in which they knocked out uh, PD one, so they were trying to generate PD one knockout cells that would hopefully uh, had less um, it, it would have less checkpoint inhibition. Didn't work that well therapeutically, but it, they did were the first ones together with the lab of Carl June, which they actually knocked out endogenous TCR using CRISPR, and but they introduced a NYE specific TCR using an was it a dentivirus or adenovirus? Adenovirus uh, uh, vector. So it was kind of a hybrid approach to changing the specificity of the T cell. Um, again, mixed results because in this time their protocols were a little bit outdated by the time the paper, kind of the, the clinical trial was finished. And they didn't have very uh, great editing efficiencies and the results were not where I think they only had one partial response, but again, it was the first time it was shown. And well, in this paper, this is the first time in which fully crispr cells, only non-viral uh, treated cells are reported. So non-viral specifically targeted CAR T cells achieve high safety and efficacy in B cell not hatching lymphoma. And First author, so it looks to be a, some kind of collaboration between several hospitals in China, uh, including hospitals in Shanghai, uh, Hangzhou. Um, I see a lot of authors. Um, so first authors is Qi Qing Chang and Yunshan Hu and Xing Huan Hang seem to be first co-authors. And then the corresponding authors, Dali Li, Bing Du, Min Xiao Liu, and He Huang are co-authors, uh, co uh, last authors. And they come from, as I mentioned, Shanghai, Huangzhou, basically, and Zhejiang University. Uh, so it's a collaboration. Anyway, so in this paper, they describe how they uh, came about doing, generating CAR T cells using uh, CRISPR um, uh, uh, T cells. And they... They have an interesting approach. They first do kind of some preliminary work, some uh, preclinical work 
in which they compare the effect of introducing a um, target, so targeting the car using a, a CRISPR, and they have a, a safe uh, gene, a safe locus in which they first introduce this this car T cell construct, so this this car construct, and they compare it to a lentiviral generated uh, uh, car T cell, and they show that it has interesting um, improved um, functionality, and they have they already show that. Uh, of course, they um, they have a much better uh, profile. They much better. Uh, the the insertion is much more um, predictable, and they have more homogeneous expression. Uh, I think it's they do a kind of an initial initial experiment showing that they can introduce a car t- uh, a car construct using CRISPR. But then I think the most interesting thing is that they move on to actually integrating this uh, CD19 car, which has a four one BB. Uh, causing military domain into the PD-1 gene. Um, they use this again by using a, a CRISPR, uh, a Cas9 that is targeted against this, this locus, and they uh, express the car um, in this in this in this place. So car car T cell positive uh, car T cells don't express PD-1. So they again the PD-1 uh, the PD-1 idea of knocking out PD-1 in these products, and they a- achieve pretty good levels of PD-1 deletion and uh, about 20% of knocking efficiency, about a 20% of, of positive cells present in the car. And in this clinical trial, they tested eight patients. Uh, again, they achieved infusion products that had uh, an average of 20% of knocking, about 60% of knockout. Uh, and uh, they also look into a little bit of the safety uh, profiles of these products. They show that there's a little bit of so, some off target, they do see a they pick up an off target uh, double strand break that occurs in a, in a gene phosphatase and acting regulator one uh, that they the authors um, suggest that because it's not apparently not expressed in T cells, it's probably a safe mutation if you have any kind of disruption of the of the reading of this gene. Um, and interestingly enough, they see durable responses in five of the eight um, patients that they treat. Uh, two of the patients, uh, two other patients do have initial responses, but they relapse after six months. And they see a partial remission in one of these uh, patients. So it's not a durable, not a complete response, but they do see responses in all patients one way or another. Uh, in all cases, they um, have ra- rather low doses of CAR T cells, which about between half and two and a half million cells per kilogram, which is in the lower end of uh, the CAR T cell doses that are used for 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 treatment of, of leukemia. Um, it's also not known really how much you actually need to add of of these cells. So there's a lot of things, a lot of variability between uh, treatment centers. But I think it's still probably on the low end. So it does seem to be that these cells are quite functional, they do some marker analyses, they show that they have really nice memory phenotype uh, markers, suggesting that they are good, uh, they have good chances of engraftment, hopefully, and to um, sustain uh, long-term um, uh, survival in the patient. It's unclear what, uh, whether these patients that re- relapse maybe had lose, have lost the CD19 target, or uh, what were the causes of relapse, but I think in general, this is a no, it's a first uh, in the field, and I'm pretty sure other ones are coming. Last time I checked, there were at least 20 clinical trials with CRISPR cells that were uh, registered and clinicaltrials.gov. So I do expect a bunch of other um, studies to come out, especially with CARs. I think CAR T cells are a very attractive um, potential area to use CRISPR. Uh, so I'm looking forward. So con- congratulations to uh, the researchers, and I hope that we can we see more of these in the future. Yeah, my wife works for Beam nowadays, which does this as well. Okay, so they're also know. having a clinical trial. They are they are getting ready for clinical trials. It looks yeah. like on their website, IND enabling studies, but they, but they do something where they don't break. The, they have a modified CRISPR which doesn't break the whole strand, but just does a single strand break so that it has less mutation. Risk. Yeah. The Nikkei's, and they do two probably. 
Well, I guess there's a lot of approaches that you can yeah. you can have. Yeah, I mean, there it was very published in Nature. I mean, it's very short paper and it's very few very few patients, but this is the first. This is a start word of why is things going to be an avalanche of uh, upcoming studies. Indeed. All right. Well, next one up. You're going to notice a theme here. Um, innate type 2 immunity controls hair, fo hair follicle commensalism by Demodex mites. Hair follicles. Okay. Yeah. So the theme of the day is commensalism. First author is Roberto R. Ricardo Gonzalez. Last author is Richard M. Lotsky. It was published August 30th in Immunity. So let's see here how to start this. So Des Demodex is the little mites that live in your hair follicles and pores, but mostly your hair follicles that um, can, they, 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 they feed off of all your oils and stuff in there, but they, they're commensal, but they can be bad actors. And so in bad actors, most notoriously is rosacea where your nose grows and it's inflamed. This happens in older adults. And so they had some mice lying around in this lab uh, that just kind of were hanging out. They, they had made some mice. Uh, they have, they found homozygously maintained IL-4-RA receptor, IL-4 slash IL-13 double knockout and STAT-6 knockout mice, all developed uh, basically facial inflammation. It got worse with age, which would be similar to rosacea. So aberrant sebaceous glands, aberrant hair follicle morphology, physical findings, facial swelling, all of that. Um, and they found that there's more des Demodex running around in them. And they have an e GFP version um, of Demodex that they had running around. So they then colonized them with those and found out that these mice, which they're basically describing as type 2 immunity deficient mice, because they all have similar def downstream deficits in what they can do. Um, these mice all had out of control Demodex colonization, like way more of it, higher rates, reactive responses and inflammation to it. And now we're done with the story now. So, so, so basically then they deep dive the whole thing after this, but that, but that's the key, right? They, they found that the type two immune response is required to hold Demodex in place. Um, so they looked at this and they saw that generally speaking, there's an ILC2 expansion as well as Tregs and type 2 CD4 and CD8 cells in these immunodeficient mice compared with wild type. They were expanded 20 to 30 fold, but they weren't doing what they needed to do. Um, IL-4-RA is the receptor for IL-13 and IL-4 that is critical for this pathway. And they also found that these IL-C2s were switching to an almost type 3 response over time, and there was more IL-22 and growth in vitro. So they kind of found out, they, they looked at human samples uh, from nasal, you know, they took nose samples from skin samples from people with rhinophyma, which is part of this rosacea demodex reaction, a downstream consequence, this rhinophyma. And they indeed had more IL-13 versus IL-4 expressing cells, but it was increased. Um, Sorry, they've been healthy people had more IL-13, IL-4, but in contrast, rhinophyma had denser inflammatory influence with less IL-13 and IL-4 expressing cells surrounding it, the, the, the hair follicles. And so those with rhinophyma and demodex phenotypically resemble the mite infection in type 2 immune deficient mice Infl with inflammation and decreased IL-13 being the main culprit. Um, they then do some SPF studies and, and other studies, um, co-housing work, and show that the IL-4-RA receptor deficient mice, um, when they're co-housed and re-derive, so if you re-derive them in SPF room and like clean them all up, nothing happens. They have to be colonized with the dem demo decks, which should happen in SPF, but apparently happens sometimes, right? Because we have it too that's when they have the problem so you have to be colonized to do this they don't develop it spontaneously you have to have the commensal there um, and if you do co-housing experiments and introduce stuff across they'll transfer it you'll transfer it from the mommy to the baby with they did a bunch of you know f1 f2 studies breeding and, and showed that basically once you get it from the parent or wherever then you have the problem 
anti-mite, but not antibacterial therapy. So antibiotics didn't do diddly, but anti-mite therapy protected, you know, the mice. Um, and it drives a key in this colonization, just at baseline, if they induce it, drives ILC2s in normal skin show up there to help control it. And then you can do this in rag mice and you're just fine. So it's really the innate ILCs that are driving this. Um, and then what happens is these in the type two deficient mice, you have the switch to an inflammatory process that's more ILC3, and it's an inflammatory rather than repair process. And um, this causes delayed hair follicle growth. So, no, excuse me. So what's weird is that the cytokines themselves, like IL-13, slow hair follicle growth down to proliferation and delay the growth, but allow repair mechanisms. And so if you do, if you block, so you can actually, the cytokines that are there to help control the infection of Demodex also reduce hair growth for whatever reason. Um, which, you know, people care about for clinical significance. So then um, if you lose the type two immunity, then this, the skin becomes leaky, it repairs less well, dyes that they put on it and other measures of leakiness of the tissue are higher. And so you're losing the barrier function as well. But basically high level ILC2s through type two immunity and uh, particularly IL-13 and IL-4 are required to control commensal demodex colonization. And if you don't have it, it goes buck wild. And then you have skin hypertrophy and inflammation. First of all, mice on my face. Oh you. yeah. There's stuff eating your face Ew. all the time right now. There's, uh, there's all your pores. They're just knobbly, knobbly, knobbly right now. I don't want to be reminded of that. The entire world is covered in poo. Oh. Anyway. So, what is not clear to me is how exactly do the ILC2s prevent overgrowth of these mites of Demodex? <clears throat> they don't get into it other than type 2 immunity signals, essentially. Okay. Um, because it's not like they're... So there's CD4 and CD8 cells that come on board that will, will control it, but they don't really figure out the signaling other than to say it's through these processes. But if there are mites, it's not like a T cell is going to, you know, latch onto it and kill it. No, it's, it seems to be that it maintains the barrier mm. and controls the environment to kind of constantly repair it and kind of keep it in check. And that mm, okay. in, the, in the absence of it, the barrier weakens and then everything goes to crap. Okay. And then the, the, the mites have the access and then they get to proliferate. And yes. Be merry. Okay. That's why the rag, you know, the rag knockout mice are fine, but there's some intrinsic properties of CD4 and CD8 cells they think are signaling to help just control the environment along the ILCs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yet another place for the ILCs to be relevant. Indeed. Excellent. They're one of my favorite immune cells. Yeah. They're pretty cool. I have to say, the more I learn about them, the more I respect them. And they hang out with enterocytes, which is also fun. That's why it's, it's just it's just guilt by association that you have. They're still it's, cool. it's, with the opposite. You have you know empathy or like sympathy for us by association. Exactly. So my second paper of the day, moving on, but staying on the T cell, you know, on the retargeted T cell topic, I have a paper from Science, uh, Science Translational Medicine called Quantitative Immunopeptidomics Reveals a Tumor Stroma-Specific Target for Spore T-Cell Therapy. First authors Gloria Kim and Jens Fritsche uh, from the labs of James Riley at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, from Ematics Biotechnologies, uh, uh, I guess di directed, guided by Tony Weinschenk. Uh, this is a company, uh, also a TCR uh, T cell, the transgenic T cell company, uh, they're also working with bispecific antibodies, so like T cell therapy company. Um, and this paper I thought it was really nice because I like the idea, which is the kind of the basics of uh, the, the the paper, which is not targeting the tumor itself, but looking f to target the tumor microenvironment uh, and specifically the stromal cells that are. Um, 
surrounding the tumor and providing the tumor cells with what really is indispensable support of uh, to for the for the tumor cells to survive. Uh, you know, including you know uh, kind of stability, physical stability, but also angiogenesis and so many other things uh, that uh, that growth factors, things like that, that really help the tumor survive. Um, so I, th I think the story, be they started looking for uh, specific peptides. Uh, we're trying to find targets that are specific for tumors that you could potentially find TCRs against. And they have, so they, what they did is kind of a unbiased, uh, large-scale uh, analysis of HLA-presented peptides. Uh, through immunopeptidomics, so basically uh, you have um, liquid chromatography, and then you have uh, in which you analyze um, peptides bound to MHCs, and you try to identify the then by MS you identify the the little uh, nanomers or tenmers that are the ones the the peptides that are bound to MHC, and try to see what exactly is being presented on the surface of tumor cells or whatever other cell you're looking at. Because sometimes, you know, you can predict this. There's these algorithms that allow you to kind of predict based on the transcriptomic data or the proteomic data of like expression levels of proteins. You have, There's algorithms that allow you to uh, identify motifs or particular sequences within these expressed genes that would potentially be loaded onto a specific MHC molecule. But of course, there's a lot of to say about doing actual experimental work in which you look at the proteins that are actually being expressed. So by doing this, they compared uh, different tumor tissues and normal tissues, and they um, they find a specific protein called collagen type five, sorry, type six alpha six, so col C A three, um, which has an epitope, uh, a peptide that is highly that is substantially upregulated only in tumor samples. They, they, they do kind of tumor, tumor tissue and they see that there's amongst the, the hits of upregulated of like peptides that are being more presented on these tumors compared to norm, normal uh, match tissue. Uh, they see these col 6 a 3 um, uh, derived peptide. And when they look at where, so they look through histochemistry, they have some some, um, uh, what's the word? They have some um, in situ hybridization uh, and some slides, and they see, they show spatially that this uh, peptide is being specifically expressed on only stromal cells and not on the actual tumor cells. So, and I think that's how they came into targeting the stromal, because we have this stromal specific protein that we don't see anywhere else. And it's been expressed in only in tumoral stroma, and which is important is throughout different tumor types. Um, they they send in the in their tumor samples that they look, they see that they can see uh, substantial amounts of this peptide being presented in almost thirty percent of the tumors they analyze, and in uh, comparison, only about one percent of healthy sam samples, uh, which in their hands were only mostly from were found only in placenta derived tissues and uh, ovarian derived tissues. Uh, that's only where they see the expression of this of this particular peptide, and this is because this peptide is derived from a alternative splicing event of this col six a three protein, and is the expression of one of the exon exon six that results in the presentation of this peptide. So not all cells are using this as splicing, and it's only happening apparently in the stromal cells. Uh, I think what was very interesting is that they focus a little bit on very quantitative analysis of the expression of the presentation of this peptide. And so they have uh, ways of through their MS uh, immunopeptidomics to quantify the amount of copies of these peptide being presented per cell on average. And they see about 230 copies of these um of these peptide from uh, I'm going to call an F F L N F L N V peptide is presented uh, in the in the cells that are positive. Uh, when they compare to the healthy cells in which they detect this, it's about 30 copies per cell. 
suggesting that the expression is much is like an, uh, almost an order of magnitude lower. And what they look at, is they, they, they think that this makes uh, FLNV an interesting peptide for, for therapy because they think that this the difference between the normal and the, and the stromal tissue is sufficient for, for targeting. And so they start looking for TCR therapy, are, are, are recognizing this peptide. So they go through, they stimulate uh, donor cells with uh, the peptides. And interestingly, they do with bead coupled uh, HLA peptide complexes. A lot of other people do a APCs, but in this case, they do a completely synthetic uh, um, platform. And they actually get come up, come up with uh, over 90 TCR sequences of TCRs that seem to be uh, responding to this peptide. And they pick up the ones they, they have best sensitivity and they have one with low sensitivity as a comparison. Um, and they actually find that they can identify uh, TCRs recognizing this peptide. And here's where they also... The, the, the recognition is, is, is good, but it's not, in their hands, it's not um, really um, su sufficient to, to respond to low amounts of, of um, peptide pres being presented. So they have one that is very high, but then it has some cross-reactivity uh, re with similar peptides. So they compare other collagen molecules that have similar, they look for similarities in the peptide uh, sequence, and they find a couple, and they compare. And they have one, one TCR that performs really good, very high uh, activation, but then it also cross-reacts with a similar protein. So that kind of rolls it out a little bit. And the one that is, seems to be very specific is not very strong. So they uh, go for affinity enhancement. Also, I think, interesting, especially because affinity enhancement, I think, for TCRs is a little bit of a um, touchy subject, I think, within the TCR engineering uh, um, community because there has been um, a case of using affinity enhanced TCRs that resulted in off-target um, activity of the of the cells. So we have recognition of a different protein of kind of cross uh, cross reaction with a pro uh, unrelated protein, which resulted in a devastating uh, result for the patient that was treated. It was I think it was like against MH A three. Uh, and it ended up recognizing a protein called Tintin that was, I think, in on 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 the, on the heart it was expressed in muscle, on, on heart tissue. So there's a lot. I think it's very interesting to look for uh, TCR affinity enhancement, but there has to be a lot of ways of evaluating potential cross uh, reactivity. And they, in this case, in their in their defense, they do. So they find a couple. They do yeast surface display. That allows them to kind of mutate the the TCR sequences, and then they get tested. Those and then those TCRs that have enhanced uh, binding to the target become kind of enriched in the final product, and then you can pick up these enriched TCRs. And they identify a couple of mutations uh, in the uh, in the CDR1, so in the complementarity determining region one on the alpha chain, and also mutations in the CDR1 of the beta chain. And they come up with a clone that is has improved sensitivity, particularly at lower peptide concentrations that are similar to what they show was kind of physiological expression, about 200 and something uh, counts, uh, molecules per, per cell being presented. Um, and that is also functional both on CD4 and CD8 and CD4 cells because this was a CD8-derived TCR, but they can enhance it to also be functional on CD4, so not require costume, uh, the, the co-receptor, a CD8 co-receptor. Um, and they go through a battery of tests to sh show or to like evaluate whether there is any cross-reactivity. So again, they, they run it against, they had run it against these uh, similar uh, peptides, particularly this one, this uh, peptide derived from the other collagen molecule called 6A1, which had been recognized by a different, by the one of the initial TCRs. And they also go and, and generate peptides with, they look for peptides with similar, uh, with similar sequences. And again, try to see their cross uh, reacting with this affinity enhanced TCRs. And I see what, what they do, what I think is interesting is that they look at the sequence of the, of the peptide and they identify amino acids that are not indispensable for TCR recognition. So those amino acids are not like they kind of, Using that information, they 
focus on every peptide that given those uh, given that uh, the, the non-importance of those amino acids increases the amount of variability that could still be recognized. So they also really go through a lot of work trying to show that there is no unspecific binding to anything else that is similar. They also tested with various uh, cell lines that are negative for this uh, Col6A3 uh, Col protein. And they also co-cultured it with normal, prim normal primary cells and uh, iPSCCs derived primary cells just to see that there's no cross-reactivity with any physiological normal protein. Um, so, and they go through big, great lengths to show that the very low potential expression of this uh, peptide that you can see in normal tissue is not sufficient to trigger response through this TCR. So, I think I really like this because the idea of targeting the stroma is, I think it's very interesting, could be very promising because the nice thing is that stroma is a st genetically stable. So you're going to have less chance of stroma, um, you know, losing the target, downregulating MHC and all the things that tumors do to escape T cell uh, function. Um, and then... If tumors don't have stroma, that also really reduces their chances to survive. And what they also, the also authors suggest is that if you have all this release of peptides and these peptides can also be end up being loaded on stromal MHCs, they can also be targeting stroma. And also some tumors also express this particular isoform of Col6A3 that has this exon. So they could also be, they also express this peptide on their surface. So the only bad thing is that when in their in vivo experiments, they did not actually do experiments targeting the stroma, targeting kind of the Col six A three positive stroma of of T cell of, of of mouse tumors because mice because it's really hard to transplant this uh, stroma from like doing uh, murinized or like humanized mice are doing this uh, PDTX or this um, sorry this uh, um, patient derived um, um, tumors on the mice. And because the stroma doesn't survive that well, and then mice don't exp don't have the same kind of pattern of expression of this particular protein, so it doesn't work with mice or mouse stroma. So they just did all the in vivo experiments using cells that have similar exp levels of expression of this peptide compared to what they see in human stroma. So that's probably one of the big drawbacks of this of this paper. But otherwise, I think it was very interesting. So do you think next step is some like monkey model or something that's more relevant or and show that there's no tox and then you go into patients? I don't think, I, I don't think they, they, they could do because also there's no guarantee monkeys have it either. I'm not, they didn't uh, test that. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a tough one because I think they also suggest, so they also show that there's other, other targets that have been evaluated. This protein has also been targeted before in a kind of a more general uh, pan target uh, as a, um, study before. But yeah, you need to show that through targeting the stroma, you can reduce the tumor. I think you can show that maybe targeting mouse stroma in a mouse tumor in a mouse and then say, well, I would expect this to be the same in humans. Uh, you can also use, for example, bispecific antibodies. Maybe that's a little bit more interesting. You can have, a instead of doing the whole work of putting T cells and making you know, engineering T cells, you can just try if you can use some um some something different to target some um but I don't know. I think it would be very difficult to to do that that it that, to test this without actually testing it in humans. All right. Well very interesting. Sounds like more work to come then. Always. All right. Well, we're going to be speaking to Dr. Ruth Slay and Sarah Clayson at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in just a moment. Before we get to that, whether you're looking to attend an immunology conference this year or to expand your network, make the most out of your experience by downloading our collection of tools to help you prepare for your next event. Stem Cell Technologies downloadable checklists and guides include recommendations on how to get ready before attending conferences, tips for networking, and best practices for your LinkedIn profile and more. Download the conference toolkit at www.stemcell.com slash conference hyphen toolkit.
We are joined today by two guests. We have Dr. Ruth Ley, who is Managing Director of the Max Planck Institute for Biology in Tübingen, in Germany, and her postdoc, Sarah Klassen, who is a postdoctoral fellow at her lab. They're going to be talking to us about a very exciting uh, paper they have in BioArchive, which I think is very exciting. We're talking you know, before the press. Very nice. And about all that has to do with microbiome. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, Brenda, since I, I could talk all day, but you're very excited about this uh, BioArchive paper. Do you, want, do you want to lead off with the, the flagellin question or do you want me to deep dive in here? Well, I guess, you know, I, sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit of an amateur when it comes to, you know, uh, microbiome host interactions. So why maybe uh, Sarah or, or, or um, Ruth can give us a little bit of background to understand this paper and how did you start working on this, on this very interesting question about why not all flagellin is problematic, right? Um, sure. So I'll explain a little bit of the background of the project. Um, so flagellin is the bacterial protein subunit of this motility apparatus, the flagellum. And a lot of the work in the field has focused on how our host innate immune system recognizes this protein when it's produced by a pathogen like salmonella. Um, but you know, in Ruth's lab, we study the gut microbiome, which is incredibly complex and composed of trillions of bacteria. And what we found is that a lot of commensals that are not pathogenic or um, potentially not pathogenic also produce uh, flagellin protein, and it contains similar residues that we know bind uh, this host immune receptor, TLR5. And so then the question was, you know, we're not all walking around with inflamed guts, and so how does our immune system um, recognize this this ligand when it's produced by you know the pathogen salmonella, but not respond aggressively when it's produced by uh, a commensal like a member of the uh, lactobacillaceae, um, and so that kind of motivated um, our investigation. And it was a natural follow up of a paper from 2013 in Roos Lab um, by Tyler Colander, uh, who also noticed for the first time that these lacnospiraceae um, gut commensals are flagellated and uh, they don't induce a huge response uh, via TLR5, but they have the residues um, for recognition by this receptor. So we thought this was very odd, right? I'd always heard that with TLR5, you, it's either turned on or it's off. And uh, the canonical examples were fly C from salmonella, which turned it on and fly from H. pylori, which did not. And so, you know, fly C binds the receptor and it gets turned on and fly A does not bind the receptor because it, it's missing proper residues. And um, it's, um, you know, when you don't bind, you don't interact and it doesn't get turned on. And then here we had uh flagellin that seemed to tune it. You could get a, a, a response that wasn't off, but it wasn't high, it was low. And so how, how could you tune a receptor? This seemed uh, very intriguing. So does this have to do with structure function relationship or something else? Is this, does, is it, is it like what I think of, I know TLR5, TLR receptors are not GPCRs, but this is a very common thing in G protein coupled receptor land, right? Where you have full agonist, partial agonist, partial antagonist, you got everything based on the shape of the ligand. Is this a similar story with this flagell, the specific flagellin, or is it a different mechanism than just a little bit of binding, but not quite, or just small conformational changes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my background is in molecular biology. And so we really were interested in how these uh, flagellin proteins interact with the receptor. Um, and so what we found is that there are some huge differences uh, between these flagellins produced by commensals compared to the salmonella canonical flagellin fly C. Um, and what we found is that there's this additional binding site in the, uh, it's the D0 domain of flagellin. It's one of the conserved regions of the protein, um, but it's, it's able to bind TLR5 and the similar region in the, the commensal derived flagellins does not have this uh, binding site. 
And what this additional buying site allows uh, FlyC to do is to target a completely different population of TLR5 receptor. And it's um, a population that exists as a unliganded uh, dimer on the surface of the cell. Um, and so we, we used a lot of uh, molecular biology techniques like pull downs in order to map uh, the interaction between the receptor and these various domains of flagellin. Um, we did domain swaps. So we found that if we took uh, a region of the, the commensal flagellin and swapped in the salmonella pathogenic flagellin part, we could then uh, restore activation um, of the TLR5 receptor. And so really, it's not necessarily like a, a tolerance thing when you think about um, the immune system seeing a commensal and then kind of being trained to not respond. We think that this is a fundamentally different way that these li ligands interact with the receptor itself. Did we know about the, or did the field know about the existence of this different population of TLR5? Or is it also new that there's something different responding to, to the flagellin? So it, the field, um, so, so what, 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 what you read about when you look up how TLR5 works is that it's ligand-induced dimerization and that there's, there's, I think the idea is you've got little monomers of TLR5 floating around and a flagellin will come and bind one and a flagellin will come and bind another one and then they'll get together as um, a, co a dimer complex of TLR5 with two flagellins and then you'll get signaling. Um, but, but that is really not what Sarah's data um, support. It, it looks much more like there's, uh, there's dimers of TLR5 that, um, that, are silent, that don't signal unless they're, um, the ligand fly C with this allostark binding site arrives and, and likely induces a conformational change that allows signaling. And this, this is consistent with some other data that have been published um, that, that are kind of a fuzzy, uh, fuzzy EM, uh, or was it, is EM? Yeah, structures. Cryo-EM. Mm -hmm. Cryo-EM structures that, 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 that indicate that, that, that there's uh, asymmetrical dimers that are present on the cell. And so, so we need to de delve deeper into this, but it looks like the, this idea that you've got ligand-induced dimerization is, is probably um, not correct. Wow, that's that's huge. So, so you have dimerization first, of which certain mm -hmm. ligands can bind. Is there also then a population of non-dimerized TLR5 running around at the same time? And why do you what makes one become the other? Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, we don't know, but I imagine that there's probably some, you know, equilibrium between monomer and dimer populations. Um but you know, we we went into this thinking that okay, we have these flagellins that bind but don't activate, so they must not be inducing dimerization. And we tried really hard to come up with an assay to to measure uh, ligand-induced dimerization. The problem is that we never found a condition in which we didn't see this this higher molecular weight band um, that corresponded to the dimer. And so you know, it's possible that. Um, different cell types have different relative amounts of dimer, preformed dimer versus monomer, mm. and that this can kind of um, tune how it responds to pathogen versus uh, you know, commensal derived flagellins. Because you can imagine if you're sampling um, the, uh, the lumen of the gut, you might not want to have um, a inflammatory response to what you are sampling. So have you guys looked like maybe an in vivo fret assay or something? So you could see, and then across cell populations, so you grow some, or, you know, intestinal cells that may be organoid or not, you grow some other cells, you, see, you can then you can see these populations and they're on and off, right? That would be cool. <laughs> we, we are currently doing that. Our focus right now is to get a crystal structure or a cryo-EM structure. Um, but Ruth didn't mention this, but um, currently there's a, a crystal structure of fly C from Salmonella uh, in complex with zebrafish uh, TLR5 ectodomain. It's a partial structure. Um, but what's interesting is that there was a follow-up paper 
by a group that showed that zebrafish TLR5 actually functions as a heterodimer, not a homodimer. And so there's a lot that we could learn from um, an updated crystal structure of TLR5. Right, because we don't actually have one for humans. And then the one that is for zebrafish is in a sort of unnatural state, if you will. The idea of kind of uh, ligand binding induced dimerization is so widely spread throughout many immunological reactions that it just made sense. There's so many other uh, proteins that do the same, or they get phosphorylated and then they dimerize and things like that, that maybe just sounded good, but maybe, yeah, it's time to look closer. <laughs> That was interesting for me coming into this because this is not really my background. And so, you know, you sort of, you, you, you read what people write generally about how these things function. And, uh, but then to go digging for the data that supports such a statement and then to not find it was kind of yeah. opening too. Like, why, why have we all assumed this? Why have we all repeated this when there's oh actually my God. no data for it? That was interesting for me. I, there's a lot of that. Like you start looking for the paper and the paper and the, and the quote of the quote of the quote, and then you end up with nothing. Uh, yeah. But it's very interesting. All I'm going to say is tetranucleotide hypothesis this is you know, <laughs> the most famous example of this I can ever think of. It was it was it was Linus Pauling suggested that the oh, yeah. tetranucleotide hypothesis, where there's four equal amounts of each nucleotide, roughly, and so it was just this junk information that scaffolded to hold whatever the genetic material was. We knew DNA had the genetic material in it for heritability, but not that it was it. They thought it was the scaffold. And he wrote this in an opinion piece in some other paper, and everyone ran with it until Watson quit. Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin uh, proved them wrong. Well, wasn't he also the idea of this triple helix thing? Uh, yeah, there was some Linus of that Pauling? too, right? But there was no data. It was just like wild speculation that everyone just assumed since it was Linus Pauling was correct. And so like, if you go back to the paper that cites the idea, that cites the idea, you just get to like some dude spitballing. Now it's an important dude, but it was still, <laughs> it was still just spitballing. Yeah. It's, 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 what's, it's what's really fun about science. And I think it's what's why it's so important to have a lot of scientists working in the same area. Mm. Right. That you, you can't just have people doing novel things and no one ever double checking or following it up or trying to repeat it and so on. Else we would never know which one of these novel ideas actually stands up to time and scrutiny or, you know, ends up being true. I completely agree. So using that as a segue, um, <laughs> the microbiome, as we all know and love, is, is a quite a hot area. Right. Like that, that being said, a lot of people always go, well, man, the microbiome is implicated in this disease or that disease. And part of your work, Ruth, is looking at the co-evolution. And I was wondering if you could speak that a little bit, because it drives me nuts when there's two types of papers. One paper goes, oh, the microbiome is implicated in this disease. And if we do germ-free, the disease goes away. So the microbiome is clearly some part of the causative agent. And then mm -hmm. other papers go, we can't figure it out. And we can't tell if it's the chicken or the egg. And, I, and I, it drives me nuts in particular, because I think chicken and egg or cart and horse is wrong as a way to look at this because it's like saying what came first the heart or the lungs uh -huh, uh -huh. right it, kind of we yeah. know hearts kind of came first for other reasons yeah. but the point being like in a human which came first you're like uh <laughs> that doesn't yeah. make sense well so, I'd, I'd love to plug a paper we have coming out next week um <laughs> hot off the press folks <laughs> yeah we have a paper coming out in science next week which is very exciting um and and we 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 asked the question, where are these, uh, where's the strain variation coming from across populations, right? So, so you look at Westerners, people dif different parts around the world, and you, you might see different microbiomes, uh, different species that are there. But then if you look within species that are shared amongst people across the world, you'll see different strains of those species um, in, in, the, in these populations. And I think we've already assumed that that reflected diet and so on, which, which might still be the case to some degree. Um, but we asked the question of, are they there because they share an evolutionary history with the populations that they're living in? So have they been passed down um, within family groups, within related people over time for so long that as people moved around the world, they carried them with them. And then you could you can see as, as people moved around the world and diversified that the microbes diversified with them. And this is something that you can see in a broader scale, if you look, for instance, in, in, um, in, in the great apes and relatives, you can see that there's been speciation with the apes of certain, certain gut bacteria. 
Um, but, but so we wanted to look at the strains this way. Um, so we, we obtained genomic information from the people, a genetic, you know, their genotypes, and then we obtained metagenomes from, 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 their, from their guts and uh, got a lot of strain information. And for about 60 species, we're able to make trees of those species with all the strains contained and then match them to the trees of the host people. So we have the human tree and the bacterial tree, and we can then match and see if, if, they, if you get the same tree, uh, which would indicate that they've, they share an evolutionary history. And for a number of them, the, the answer is yes, you do see this. Um, so, so this indicates that as, you know, over long periods of time, as people moved around, they've carried these microbes with them um, to such a degree that as the people changed, the microbes changed um, with them. When you did this awesome work that's coming out next week in science, in case anyone missed <laughs> that, um, did did you see certain genes that were the ones changing that tracked? Like I think of things like IgA secretion, HLA types, other immunology genes. I'm sure there's some other things too, but maybe metabolism genes, like people who are better at metabolizing glucose need bacteria that metabolize glucose less or something like, depending on what you mean by more or less. But like, did you see certain things that we think would make sense track? Yeah. So, so, so what we did see, and, and this was inspired by the people who look at like insect symbiont systems, where there as, as the symbionts get irretrievably linked to that host and can no longer live outside of it, you, you see genome reduction, you see loss of non-essential genes, um, things like this. And that's what we see um, in, in these bacteria that are showing us a really high degree of cophylogeny. We see that they have smaller genomes um, they are enriched in essential genes, they're losing other stuff. Um, we know that they're more oxygen sensitive. Uh, we also tested them in the lab for this. We know that they, um, they're sensitive to lower temperatures. So you put them at a temperature that's lower than body temperature, and they don't survive that. So, so they're, 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 they're showing us all these traits of, of host dependence. It looks like they really can't live outside of the host. And so it, it makes sense that these are the ones that have to be passed person to person. And, and so this is why you can imagine that over long periods of time, then they're going to uh, give you these patterns of sharing the history. But specifically, what exactly what types of genes and, and pathways and so on, that's something that we're following up with now to, to try to dig deeper into this. Anything in the humans as well, like humans, like these species tracked with these HLA types or anything like I know that's been shown other times generally that some microbe species, you know, some microbiome analyses and patterns, depending on how you want to define that PCA analysis or what have you, map with certain HLA types. The, we don't know yet, so that's that's what we're we're digging into. Yeah, just to understand. So you, you mentioned coevolution. So coevolution means uh, adaptation to each other from both sides. It's actually never been shown, but but for for for, for gut bacteria and, and humans, or for my, microbiome in humans, so. But in order to have coevolution, you have to have a long-term association. And I think we've set the stage for that. You know, we know that there's been long-term association. Now we can perhaps look for, for reciprocal adaptations that would indicate coevolution. It's, well, I think it's clear that, yeah, we have been living with this microbes for so long. So there must be some, of course, there's some sort of, as you said, Evolution, maybe not coevolution, because that's a very technical term, but we've been evolving with them in a way, and, and, and we've been changing together. You, you published some years ago uh, uh, an interesting short communication in which you showed a relation between uh, ob obesity and microbiome. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been really that idea has been studied so much more from then to now. I think now it's not so controversial to say that uh, the microbiome is affecting things as our weight. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you could maybe comment a little bit on how our understanding of how the microbiome influences our health and our things that seem, uh, not that, not that uh, the connections seem kind of strange at first, uh, mm -hmm. How has that evolved since then? 
Yeah, well, so, I mean, I think using the obesity example is uh, an interesting test, test I mean, an interesting way to think about it. So we, we made an initial observation uh, in, in Jeff Gordon's lab back in, two, two, it was published in 2006, that we, um, we saw that uh, the, the microbial ecology of the gut was different for, for um, obese um, individuals, especially as they lost weight. We saw changes and they were consistent with what we'd seen in, in mice um, that had a, an obese phenotype versus a lean phenotype, for example. So these were some of the, this was, I think this was the first link um, to a health state in a human that, that we'd observed. So it was, it was pretty exciting to think about all the implications. Why, how, how does this happen? Um, does, the, does this altered composition of the, the gut microbiome actually somehow um, feed into to the, the state of obesity or you know, so so there was a, there was a really a, a ton to explore, and then the the um, um, there was a lot of follow up by you know an immense number of uh, colleagues who who um, went went looking also in their populations and so on, and so and so then what what you what you started to see was a uh, um, people seeing you know wh what aspects of what we saw made sense in their context, and of course obesity is is a very comp it's a very simple term for some for 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 a lot of complexity underlying that you know that there's um there's a there's different metabolic states um there's this and you're dealing with people who might might be you know eating all different ways taking all kinds of different medication having all kinds of underlying conditions and so so what happened after that initial simple looking observation was was digging in and saying okay well this what this is, happens in this context and not that context and um you know really getting getting into you know what what are we seeing here that's that's just reflecting the metabolic state of these people what are we seeing here that's reflecting the immune state of these people and 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 i, I think this is part of why the microbiome if you will feel boomed is because there were all these different um ways of trying to really understand you know what are we linking this to, and why, and how, and what are the feedbacks, and so on, and um, and I and I think we're starting to see it crystallize out into. I mean, I think you also see this that there's this subfields, and and you know, there's people are really focused on the immune side of things. There's people are really focused on the metabolism side of things. There's people, um, and I think with, with that exercise, which takes a long time, and we're talking already 10, 15 years, which makes sense to me that it would take that long to start teasing all this apart, um, that, that we're really now probably getting to the point we can say, okay, microbiome is, uh, you know, linked here, and maybe this is a place where we can go in and, um, and use the microbiome to tweak what we want to tweak, perhaps. Like, I think we're getting to that point, uh, but uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, the the obesity stuff was a, was a very initial observation, and now I, I think we have an incredibly expanded view of of um, how, you know how how microbiome functions in different contexts, and and um, wh whether or not we might be able to to use it. That was going to be my follow up question. So, the field is young, which is one answer, but almost every microbiome therapy has failed in the clinic with the exception of C. diff. Every other trial will have some great phase one, maybe a phase two, always dies in phase two or phase three. So with all this going at it and, you know, you know, obesity was like, you know, IBD was one big one that's still very hard, but then you have all this inflammation. So who knows like how much that's screwing up trying to do therapy with inflamed guts and bugs and that, that makes it hard, right? But like obesity is like, the big one ignoring the pun here like it's 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 really you know a giant field a giant health problem and yet every trial has just died any thoughts on like are is it just a lack of knowledge like it, it has not made it in the clinic and there was this big boom in the mid 2010 you know the 20 the first decade of the 2000s and even into the second where a lot of money was thrown at it to try to get there was it just too soon or was there something else we're doing wrong I don't think we've ever, I, I don't think people think microbiome is a sole causative agent of XYZ. So maybe we shouldn't expect it to be a sole causative cure for XYZ. Maybe it's something to think about in combination with, with other things that may, 
might enhance how how um, other therapies work, right? In in a in a, in a combinate, combinatorial fashion. Um, that that it's something that could perhaps exacerbate problems, and so then perhaps it could also be part of the solution, but to not necessarily expect it to be the whole solution, because I don't think it's ever really the whole problem. That that's my inclination as well. That's why you see, like, I think immuno oncology is interesting now because it's modifying. Uh, yeah. Metabolism of chemotherapeutics. I mean, if or, if you have instances where the microbiome is is messing up your drug regimen because it's metabolizing drugs a certain way, maybe you can, you know, inhibit that from happening or in in certain contexts, right? And and I I think there's a lot more to discover in terms of um, microbiome genotype interactions that might affect um, um, risk for certain diseases that we probably need to know a lot more about where where perhaps you, you know just extrapolating from the h pylori example where you know that there's genotype strain interactions that really really put you at high risk for gastric cancer maybe in the microbiome genotype interactions can could be sort of you know improved uh you know, if we if we understand how they interact to, to to affect risk, but I'm not sure we we're at this yes. stage of data collection where we could do that intelligently at this point. I agree. We're starting on the collection, maybe not on the being able to use the information yet. Uh -huh. As you know, right? You have a science paper coming out with all this data, and there's like how much more analysis? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's why we have tenure. <laughs> and big computers. Yeah. Fair enough. Um. Coming back to the other publication that I, I assume is also coming in the near future from, from Sarah, mm -hmm. it's really nice because we got to to read the, the preprint on BioArchive. And I think it's the first time that we get the chance to discuss with a guest uh, a BioArchive paper. And I think it'll be kind of interesting to talk about the experience of the decision of uh, publishing uh, before publishing, kind of uh, getting it out there for everyone to see because it's not, although it's being more and more common, especially after uh, COVID and all the, the urgency around publishing the data from COVID studies, uh, what made you decide to show your work uh, on BioArchive and how is the revision going so far? And has, it, has having the paper on BioArchive changed anything in your opinion? Well, um, I think the decision to post was fairly simple. Um, I had already given uh, lectures on the story, so um, there was no concern with um, potentially keeping it like a blinded review. Um, and then also, you know, there's a huge benefit to the field in terms of providing um, this information before the peer review process has finished because it can be a multi-year, um, you know, journey to get something published. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't difficult, I think, for us to put it on BioArchive. And I, Ruth is a huge proponent of, um, open access science anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think with this, I, 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 I'm yeah, I'm a huge fan of BioArchive. I'm a huge fan of uh, of of putting putting the information out there early. Um, we've we've had a lot of positive experience from this kind of thing where people have contacted us and uh, we've actually even added data and added authors uh, to to work, you know, uh, because they 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 saw our us talk about it or read the preprint and then said, hey, you know, I have some data for you to add to your paper, and we've you know we've enhanced the paper before sending it off um, for peer review, for instance. And, and also, you know, in terms of people's career development, um, we've, there are the many examples now I can think of of people um, interviewing for, for, for assistant professor positions, for instance, with a bioarchive paper and actually uh, getting the job and the, you know, the, the paper comes out later in a journal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if they'd had to wait to have the paper actually in print in the journal, it probably would have set them back another year uh, yeah. in their career. And so, you know, also for, for Sarah, um, I, I think if she, you know, there's some opportunities perhaps this fall for her to 
the look for a tenure track position and um, having this paper out discussed already, <laughs> yeah. you know, shows that it's interesting. And, and that she wouldn't have, wouldn't have had this opportunity if, if it weren't up on BioArchive. I think it also helps us recruit people too, um, because mm -hmm. it sometimes websites aren't uh, updated that frequently. Um, and so <laughs> for recruiting um, additional master students and, and PhD students, it's useful for them to see kind of what the lab is working on at the moment. Yeah. I've seen some philosophical discussions on, on science Twitter uh, about whether the preprints are challenging um, traditional peer review, whether a preprint is enough or, or not. Uh, I don't know if you have any opinions on on whether normalizations of preprints were substantially change our view of peer review. I think, you know, peer review is still very thorough, even if you have a preprint up. Um, I mean, Sarah's paper's gone through one round of of um, review. We we had um, three really really thorough reviews, um, and the you know when 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 the paper actually comes out in in a journal, well, hopefully when it does, um, it's it's going to be better than the preprint uh, be because these people put in the time to really think about it and make recommendations and say you know this was you know clarify this do you know, back this up, this kind of thing, right? It's, it's very, it's still very valuable. We still very much value that. And, and so in combination, I think it's great because we, you know, you, you get to put something out that's already quite substantial and then perfect it. I think that's a good way of seeing it. I guess also during COVID, there was some of the cases in which preprints died on, yeah. on peer review or, substantially changed but then everybody had only seen the preprint and people forgot that there was a final uh, version or there was a, a review that had to come um so that's i think led to some confusion or some even i would say mishandling of of of, of the of this this the academic uh sharing of data because in the end, some of them were just poorly, poorly written papers that were got, uh, got publicity and got attention when they might have not have earned it uh, after after peer review. Uh, I think it's very interesting. I hear a lot of discussion about this, and so it's, I, I, I am a completely up for uh, preprints. I think is 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 a great way of exactly as you said, getting, showing, you know, getting the the, the 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 work out there, and also having the chance of other people looking at it and and providing feedback and um, providing potential collaboration and things like that i think is great but uh yeah i always uh, a review a peer review is kind of the best system we have so far so we i don't think we are ready to give it up right i've never done a preprint we were talking about it during the pandemic but then we got through the review process and it worked out um the timing didn't require that but it's interesting and i agree the pandemic really I think preprints were going one direction and then the pandemic saw where it could go awry just by being a data dump that then, you know, news outlets would pick things up. You're like, whoa, 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 that, 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 that's a real early data folks. Yeah. And the public doesn't necessarily understand that even among preprints, there's like the paper that's submitted and is on preprint while you do the reviews versus the thing that I just did three weeks ago that I'm throwing yeah. there and that there isn't that stage gate. And so I think, I think, I think over time we'll have to find a way to communicate those those different levels of of what's being done or scientific journalism has to get better at knowing what to report or not. Mm -hmm. but, but that being said, we are going to start running out of time. Um, so we're going to jump to our uh, fun questions we ask at the end. Uh, Sarah, we're going to have you go first, which is if you were not a microbiome scientist or doing science mm -hmm. in general, what would you be doing instead? <laughs> um, well, thank you for that question. Uh, so one of the great things about uh, living in Germany is the biking infrastructure. Um, it's phenomenal here. Uh, I was just biking across uh, Croatia and the biking infrastructure was not up to the German standard. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things that I really appreciate and would, would do in a different life um, is be involved in 
city planning and transportation and how you basically um, provide more equitable access to uh, the roads. Um, I did my, my PhD work in Baltimore and I kind of experienced what the city was like before widespread use of bike lanes um, and after. And it's, it's incredible how empowering it is in order to be able to move um, through a city uh, safely without a car. And so definitely I would be involved in, in city planning, um, particularly with an emphasis on, on transportation. If I may ask, have you been to the Netherlands? I, <laughs> I've only visited. Um, you, but, because yes. if you like bikes, you have to come here. The Germans, amateurs. The Dutch, yeah, but now they, they have are the e-bikes. Pro- <laughs> with e-bikes, like with regular bikes. Like they also have like, they well, they call the grandma bikes, the oma feet, and they just go like, <laughs> very, you know, these, you see these ladies wearing like, I don't know, like attire for, they're going out and they're on their bikes perfectly, you know, and everybody bikes everywhere. And the infrastructure in the Netherlands is superior to Germany. If I, I know I'm biased because I live here, but it's, it's excellent. It's And and I'm going to recommend a YouTube channel for you called Not Just Bikes that exactly talks about exactly that urban oh, planning. Excellent. It's fantastic. I love it. And it just reinforces all that I already know about how nice life is here with all the bikes. So we have one more question for Ruth. Uh, if there is uh, any misconception that you could, uh, you know, set right, what would it be? Well, I think often students starting out think that uh, when you when you come into science, you you learn your thing, you you become an expert, and then that's what that's what you're going to keep doing in science. And my experience with being in science was that you could you can move around between topics to to a point. I mean, I don't think I could ever be a nuclear physicist, um, but I was trained in ecosystem ecology and. Um, And now I've just done this paper with Sarah that really has a strong immunology bent. And uh, I, I never, never would have imagined that happening, right? And that, that, you, can, you, that, that you can move around be- between scientific disciplines within science as a scientist and, and that you're not siloed is something that I, I think uh, s- students need perhaps to hear more because it might make science more attractive. Yeah, that's brilliant. I, and I, not only students, I would say, I think everyone in science needs to hear that. I guess that especially there, there's such a, there's such a drive to specialize and become a huge expert on a, on a very specific topic sometimes, right? It's, it can be hard to allow yourself to keep your, your interest kind of wide. And it could be, it'd be kind of scary. I mean, you have to have the right collaborators and, and it can be, you know, it's, it's quite challenging to, to, take on a new area than and not you know mess you know not make basic mistakes but if you have the right people around you um you know it's it's possible to to to, to sort of start crawling into crawling into different areas that are adjacent to yours and and before you know it you're in something quite different and and the microbiome is great for that because the microbiome you know it, for me it took me from soils into the gut and you know now now bordering on immunology for instance So it's 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 a great interdisciplinary means of, of of getting around between disciplines. Well, with that, we will have to bid adieu. But um, we're looking forward to it sounds like two papers coming out in relatively reasonable amount of time from you guys. So much for joining. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at at immunopodcast or by email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time.